The broadcast has started. You are now live. Thank you all for joining the Build Buyer Partner panel. We have some great experience among the team here. My name is Margaret O'Connor. I'm the moderator. I've been working in fintech since before the phrase was established, <laughs> I'm helping MasterCard set up pioneering use cases for uh, banks in China, India, and Southeast Asia, and helping to build bridges to Silicon Valley, um, the beginning of e-commerce. Um, we're going to start today with um, Miguel, who's the head of investment banking for Citibank in Africa. He's had the experience to do a number of IPOs and M&A deals, including Jumia, who you all heard from on Tuesday. Miguel, you want to talk about the M&A landscape and uh, what you see happening in fintech in Africa, please? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is, is Miguel Azevedo. I, I, I run the investment banking business um, in Africa and the Middle East, which is you know, the right combination for Jumia, for example, but it's also the right combination for Network International, who we, we helped uh, on the IPO and more recently on doing the acquisition in Kenya of DPO on one of the largest fintech transactions in Africa ever. Um, I would say, uh, you know, uh, in a slightly random order, uh, I'll, I'll make a few comments. Uh, first one is uh, fintech and, and banks and what, what's happening in this space. Everybody is, is, is getting very attracted by the numbers that we see on fintech deals, right? Um, DPO, $25 million of revenue, $288 million of transaction, of transaction value. Uh, pay stack, maybe what, $10 million of revenues, $200 million. Uh, so th this, is, this is very exciting. At the same time, when you look at banks, you have some of the largest banks in, in Africa trading at 500, 600, 700 million dollars. So there's a big gap here. Um, Why fintechs are, are being valued at um, 20 times revenue, the banks are being valued at the discount to the book value. But on the other end, some of the banks, they actually have some fintech business embedded. So there's this tension of you know, why are we not being valued? So I think that explains a little bit what we have been seeing more recently of some banks um, announcing that they will carve out their digital business. And uh, digital is a proxy for fintech. Uh, and so that's one trend I think we're going to see is banks um, uh, showing their digital business and how profitable that is and how much it is growing. The second comment I would make is that banks are doing this because they already have digital, which they did not have three or four years ago, or not everyone. So most of the banks have done uh, uh, a lot of progress in this respect. Some have developed their own uh, digital uh, businesses, I would say probably Equity Bank in, in Kenya is a great example of that. Others have acquired banks that were much more digital than the acquire. That's the case of Access Bank in Nigeria when they acquired Diamond Bank. And since then, for example, in the case of Access, we have seen a massive um, progression, a, a massive move towards digital, where digital is actually the main source of new clients and new business. So banks are learning fast and they are trying to move in that direction very fast, including uh, by acquisition. Um, uh, the third comment I would make is, um, is the access to capital. Um, Fintechs, if they are very successful at some time, they have to go either IPO or sell themselves. Um, and uh, how can do they how can do they do an IPO? Um, and that's where you know I, I think we we should take some lessons as well from what happened recently in China with Ant Financial, which you know the IPO was done and then it was had to be pulled because of regulatory issues. Um, and being regulated is actually very, very important. I remember a year ago in September, in one of your uh, roundtables in New York at the time, um, we were you know, in a roundtable, a lot of uh, fintech entrepreneurs, and I was talking about you know, the need to be regulated. Um, some eyebrows uh, clearly be, were raised there. You know, what is this uh, being regulated? But it's very critical. Um, 
if you want to raise capital if you, or if you want to sell yourself um, because that is the way uh, the flip side of certainty and security so that that's another element that, that I would say is 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 very important um, um, you know finally I, I would say that from a sort of a more global perspective some of the big banks like Citi uh, we are following uh, the fintech scene uh, very, very closely in many different formats. One of them is you know, talking to these companies so that we can raise capital for them, we can help them on M&A. The other one is we have our own labs and, and we organize, for example, in the Middle East and Africa, some contests where uh, companies come and present their business model and, and, and we do workshops around that. Uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, the winner of that was Fori, which is now worth a billion dollar listed in Egypt. Uh, and the other element is we, as a city, it's not myself and not my group, uh, but we also invest in 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 uh, in, 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 in fintechs, um, primarily in the US, but globally, but led from the US. And and we do that in a sense to be connected into this very creative, ingenuous world and. Um, and we, we we then incorporate some of those solutions into mainstream business of of a global bank. So um, you know, even the global banks they are following this extremely closely, uh, of course, because this is the future. And and as a final remark, I, I would make a point. A few years ago, I was going around Africa with a very large Chinese digital slash fintech company, and we were asking them if, if they wanted us to introduce them to banks. And they said, no, because we, we, we compete against banks. We cannot partner with banks because our aim is to disrupt the banks. I think, I think that since then, things have evolved and, and, and there are partnerships and ways of cooperating and, and, and building upon each other's strengths. But it, it's a fascinating world uh, that we are seeing. And um, uh, the final message is, and building on this uh, network slash uh, DPO transaction where we actually raised $200 million in the equity market in three days. The market is open for these stories. Uh, the market may not be open for you know, a, a power company in Africa right now, but it is definitely open for a FinTech business in Africa if size is big enough to to allow for a capital market transaction. So it's really a, a bright spot in the continent and there is no lack of ingenuity, no lack of entrepreneurship, and I would add no lack of capital. Let me stop here. Loved your comment about the ingenuity. Before um, we move on to the next speaker, uh, can I have some of your comments about African capital markets? Clearly cities looking at supporting TEP tech companies and other companies listing on glo global IPOs, UK and US. But uh, what do you think needs to happen for tech companies to be able to access African capital markets and asset managers uh, to help enable their growth? Yes, um, very good question. And, and funny enough, just two hours ago, I was on a stock exchange uh, conference together with Network International, which is a company I've referred a few times here, and the CEO talking about IPOs in Africa. And so I, this, the, I would say that to do an IPO in London, for example, in the US, you have to have, let's say, five, five topics or, or five features. One is you have to have a track record, cannot be an idea. Public markets don't fund ideas. Uh, venture capitalists do, not capital markets. So you have to have a track record. You have to have a strong growth profile. Not difficult because these are all new stuff, um, and uh, growth is at the very much at the uh, at the uh, DNA of these companies. But you have to show the case for growth and that you are uh, meeting someone else's needs that will uh, bring you growth. Uh, third, uh, you have to have um, a great management team that can deliver uh, and um, can deliver and can be seen as as, as very credible. And fourth, um, you have to be realistic in terms of pricing. You cannot aim to take the, the very last cent from the public market investor. They will invest in you 
because they also want to make money. So you cannot expect to get everything at IPO. It's a journey. That's why it is called the IPO discount. You, you come in at the price that allows others to make. And then as you progress, price goes up. And finally, five, you have to have the right set uh, of governance, both internal in terms of reporting, audit, um, independent uh, board members. Sometimes it's a little heavy, uh, especially for a very entrepreneurial company, but it is a requirement. But also then in terms of the, the, the whole ESG space, which in fintech comes into sort of financial inclusion, inclusion and, and that all space that, that is very important and you need to show that um, that makes your business more sustainable and more successful. So I would say those five things. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, talking about governance and um, moving to the next speaker, Jorge is a fellow ex Citibank who spent the last four plus years building FinConnecta, which is systematically helping financial institutions and fintechs collaborate uh, with their middleware. Um, and he started his career at Citibank in risk management and credit. So clearly understands the nuts and bolts of, of what drives a lot of decisions in big financial institutions. Tell us your opening remarks, please. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and uh, well, first, uh, thank you for having me and, and thank you for those participating and uh, spending some time with us. This is an amazing topic, especially in Africa. I started my digital journey, I'm going to say, probably like 20 years ago. Uh, when I was in City, I was the head for Digital Bank for Latin America. And at the end of my uh, my journey in City, I was the head for FinTech globally. And uh, when we started doing a hackathons and collaboration uh, initiatives in the world at City, we started in Africa. Well, first we started in Latin America, so that was the first test, but then we quickly jumped to Africa. And the reason for that is because we saw that Kenya was doing amazing things. This was a little bit after M-Pesa. And uh, the funny story about that is that when I went to city's president and say, hey, let's do an innovation program in Africa and uh, let's go to Kenya. And, and I remember he said, but wait a minute, we don't have a, a consumer business in, in Kenya. So the, the, the country is very small. Why, why do you want to do that? No, let's do it here in New York. And I'm like, yeah, yeah I mean, New York is fine, but uh, you're not going to find the kind of innovation that you will find in places like, uh, of course, Kenya. No? And, and so we did uh, many innovation programs in Africa after that. We did... Uh, in, in Kenya, we did it in South Africa, and then we started traveling around the region. So, and the reason why I'm saying that is because even though FinTech in, in Africa is not as developed in, in other regions, it does have a very, very strong roots. You know? and, and the people in the region are very innovative. They do a lot with uh, a lot less than other places. And we were just discussing before we started the, the, this panel uh, the, the the level of uh, seed and, and A round sizes and that we see in the region, in African region compared to others, is very small. So and companies are able to build things with a lot less than in other places. So that that helps ignite innovation. So w when I started with all of this uh, hackathons, thoughts and collaboration, all of that when I was at City, Africa was was uh, part of our starting process so that, that's a little story on on how how we started at city the reason why city at the time and, and miguel might know this as well we started doing hackathons and, and collaboration program and this is back in 2012 2013 was because we realized at citibank that building technology alone will not take city too far because uh city has uh, this uh, budget of billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars in technology development, but it's not enough, right? So at one point I, w I went to the uh, senior senior management stuff and say, hey, we need to open our doors and, and let third party developers come, pull our information and build for us. You know, and I'm not talking about FinTech B2C, I'm talking FinTech B2B, 
okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, at first they thought I was kind of crazy. They said, hey, you need to talk to HR. But then after a couple of meetings, they said, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's spend some time on this. So we ended up opening on APIs, right? So that was for us the, the, the big jump start of let's start collaborating. So that got me this idea of, hey, we need to build something that is not just for one bank at City. And that's how I left City years after that and created FinConnecta, right? And what FinConnecta does for those that don't know us yet is we are a, um, an integrated ecosystem where we plug in banks once and we plug FinTechs once and we let the community do the business. So if you are a financial institution and you want to work with multiple FinTechs, what you do today is you probably do integrations one by one, prioritization, a lot of investments, and then, and then it's difficult for you to move forward. So now what we do as FinConnecta is we connect with the bank once and through that single integration, we're able to integrate multiple FinTechs. So basically what we're doing is accelerating the process of collaboration and software as a service and, and uh, create a true ecosystem. And, and uh, as Miguel some, said something at the beginning that I think is extremely important, which is valuation, right? When, when we're looking at valuation of FinTechs and banks and what Miguel said is, is so right and it's happening not just in Africa, but everywhere, when we see the valuation of banks going down, because in general, they are going down and we see fintechs going up, there's only one answer to that. And that answer is the scale. Banks have proven to be not good at scaling. I mean, they were good at scaling before because they had a, a certain uh, rate of scaling that it was good by for the time, right? So you will open branches and then you will start scaling and, and the way we used to see scaling before, but now that doesn't cut, right? Because now you see companies on the fintech side that they're growing a million, 10 million, a hundred million in six months, right? Banks cannot do that. And one of the reasons why banks cannot do that is because I'm going to the topic of build, buy, and partner, right? Is right. because they're trying to build their own infrastructure. So for financial institutions that still we that they have to build their infrastructure, what happens is that they are not able to gain scale. That's why their prices go down. So uh, I might over, be oversimplifying this, but when you really analyze what's going on in the market and you compare banks and fintechs, you will realize that the big difference there is the capacity of scaling. So that's, that's when we go to this uh, topic of partnering and we think, okay, so is, is there sort of like a hybrid, right? Because we're not going to say, okay, banks are not going to transform themselves into fintechs. That's not going to happen, no? But they can stop building on their own and start partnering more. And ideally, that will help them grow their business and start picking up some scale. Once they start showing the scale to the market, the prices will start going up. So it's... Uh, it is a complicated thing, but at the same time, it's, it might be easier to simplify it if you start analyzing the big asset that you need to have today, which is your ability to innovate and your ability to scale. Okay, so that's uh, in general how as FinConnecta we see the financial world going. And there's one more element that we should add, and I don't, I don't mean to talk about something that is kind of nascent, but I think that it's extremely important, which is DeFi, right? The decentralized finance to me is, uh, it's what's going to govern the financial world in five to 10 years from now. You know, DeFi has been growing so rapidly and it's, uh, and it's so amazingly well-structured that I think that DeFi will become part of uh, everyone's days, lives and, and years to come. And if, you, and if you put DeFi in all this idea of build, buy, and partner, that's the only way that financial, financial institutions have to be part of that. That's the only way for they to really survive and being able to have their valuation grow. And maybe I'm going to stop there. I don't know if I, in my 10 minutes, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot to talk on this topic. 
And, and before we move on to the next speaker, um, if I could just ask you one question. And when we're talking about banks partnering with fintechs, and thank you very much for really distilling the point about how that could help the bank's valuation. But one of the sticking points that I've seen in real life is if the bank's management KPIs are not adjusted to enable collaboration in this new territory. It's not about technology. Often it's about management incentives and structures and reward and recognition programs. So I'm wondering if you could speak to your experience in that space. Of course, of course. And, and, and thank you for asking that because actually we think of digital as a technology discussion, you know, and uh, we, we work with many financial institutions around the world and we have spoken with many of them in the region in Africa and outside Africa. And when you start talking about digital transformation or digital programs or any, anything like that, they bring you the CTO, right? Yeah. Okay. You need yeah. to talk with this guy. And actually the CTO is not the guy to talk with because, and that's when you know that they have a problem, right? Because yeah. uh, digitization, digital transformation, digital business, all of this is a strategic discussion. It's a business discussion. It's how you're gonna go about building scale, right? And um, when you talk with financial institutions and they say, hey, I have uh, 800,000 clients and they, they think they have a good base and, and they do 800,000 clients, it's, it's a nice number. And if they have 5 million, they say, oh my God, I have a 5 million. And when you say, okay, do you know how many um, users uh, let's say PayPal has, right? So they're, so the, in, in, and when you tell them, hey, when you digitize, are you trying to grow this on a 10% and a three times uh, type of ratio? That's when they start realizing that, wait a minute, that's not a discussion for the CTO, right? Because the CTO, they, they're amazing people and, and they know their job well, but they are the builders. They are the ones that have to help use the tools, but not, not defining what the tools will do. Right, so, so all of this discussion of build, buy, digitization, partnering, and all of that, it's not a technology discussion. It's a way of doing business. And that's something that uh, financial institutions need to get more comfortable with. And if I could add, it, it, it's a commercial dis discussion. And for many African institutions, it's also part of their social contract to operate. Right. Historically, the banks, the biggest banks in Africa have been the biggest and best employers. They provide a lot of skills training and development. Um, really? But right. But as they're looking to evaluate investment or partnership in new technology, it's going to displace some of their traditional jobs. So now what do we do about that? So it's, you know, really, I think to to insert here African social contract and the license to operate. And it comes with a lot of responsibilities for protecting the ecosystem and ensuring affordable digital financial services for, for many more people in the market. So if we can move on to Alina, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Founders Factory Africa. I noticed that you started your career um, uh, in the World Bank in Geneva. So clearly a world citizen having spent a lot of time in Europe doing global partnerships before moving to Joburg to help set up Founders Factory Africa with great support from Standard Bank. So if you can talk to us about your experience uh, with Build, Buy and Partner. Thank you, Margaret. And such a pleasure to be on this panel and to hear all the other uh, speakers. Um, and I think that it's a really, um, you know, it's a really interesting discussion. Um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of dialogue around what is partnership and and what is partnership specifically within the the fintech banks and telcos and and how that sort of um, illuminates itself across the emerging markets and, and other markets. Uh, you mentioned my time at the World Bank, uh, and I was smiling because. Uh, let me tell you a story. I mean, whilst I was there for quite a few years, uh, and yes, indeed, I was based out of Geneva in Switzerland and working with um, uh, the, the uh, numerous um, organizations uh, that are based out of Switzerland. Um, so most of the, the World Trade Organization, World Health Organization and others, um, the United Nations is, is of course there. 
Um, and, uh, you know, over and over again, there was this uh, for a long time and, and perhaps, you know, still part of the discussions and the, and, and the dialogue is uh, this kind of nexus between the private sector or the business community um, and the public sector or the development sector, you know, and um, it is quite prominent because, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we partner, how do we work better together between sort of the UN and all the specialized and, and the multilateral community with the private sector and the business community um, and this feeling that the private sector has the capital uh, and, and is, is very agile and is very dynamic and the, the development sector has access to uh, you know these markets and governments um, but doesn't have the other two so how do we how do we fit that gap um, and it was on many people's minds and, and, and I believe it perhaps still is um, and then as I moved into out of the development sector and into the um, well, let's say the venture capital venture development world and the world of innovation and entrepreneurship um, I find myself in very similar conversations because here I was talking to banks and corporates and other institutions going, here we are and we've got this nexus between us, the big sort of mammoth uh, uh, tankers. Um, how do we become more agile? How do we work better with the startups? You know, that the people who are sitting in the garage who are disrupting us and who are uh, creating these new solutions for consumers um, and are so digitally uh, savvy and creating new technologies uh, that are enabling them to scale up, uh, as Jorge uh, spoke to, much quicker. Um, and so it's, it's interesting. And so I think, uh, you know, what, what it highlights for me is that, um, you know, partnership is and collaboration is at the heart of it. I think we'd all be kidding ourselves if we think that, you know, the UN or any other organization can can fix the can fix all of our uh, capital or other problems uh, in emerging markets um, uh, uh, or the, the private sector or any corporate or any bank um, or any fintech. So I think that this kind of triangle um, a way of thinking about how we work all together as the enabling system uh, is very important. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about um, Founders Factory Africa and what we do and, and how we think about and what's what's on our mind and what's on my mind a lot these days. Um, our focus is um, on building and scaling companies. Our focus is on early stage companies, so pre-Series A. Um, and the reason that's our focus is because we believe very much, uh, and again, emerging markets, but specifically in Africa, um, there is uh, enormous opportunity to increase the pipeline of scaled companies. Um, we were just talking earlier amongst ourselves about how many unicorns there are in Africa, and you can count them with one hand. Whereas if you look at other Asian markets, you obviously look at Europe, US, um, you know, there's tens and, and, and hundreds of them. Um, and so the question is why? And and for us at FFA, the answer is that because the early stage, the pre-Series A ventures um, actually do not have the right access to A, capital, um, uh, but also uh, very clear support um, and very clear resources and, and infrastructure. And I want to sort of emphasize that it's not just we need more money, um, but it is very much about we need the right type of capital at the right time. Um, and I think this is something that's kind of underlying at the moment in the ecosystem is that when you look at uh, a, a, um, uh, a founder who has started uh, and has a concept um, and you look at uh, the trajectory uh, of growth of, of, the, of, the, um, of the venture from concept to pre-seed to seed, let's say supersede uh, pre-series A and series A. There's enormous amount of variety there. And I think in Africa specifically, we haven't yet achieved a clarity of mind of what each stage means, what the needs are and what the evidence base is for it. Um, in fact, we've just done a, a, a sort of a report with Brighter Bridges, a research company that, that sort of un highlighted and illuminated um, you know, the investors, whether it's VC or even angels, but mostly kind of the VC community, um, don't have the right uh, terminology or framework to um, to sort of uh, understand or qualify what a, a C stage company is. You know, for some, for some, the ticket sizes um, are 25,000, for others, uh, it is up to a million. So, and that obviously affects valuations. Um, and so I think there's an enormous amount of fragmentation uh, in 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 that very sort of uh, uh, phase of uh, seed to to Series A, 
why is it important? Um, well, it's important because a as the um, you know as partners as that enabling ecosystem, um, it is it is our responsibility to create the right environment um, for these ventures to to scale and to grow. Um, and what that means, and, and this is you know this is where we play um, play a role, is having the right um, investment. Uh, the right, uh, obviously, sort of uh, uh, growth capital, the right scale capital, but also having uh, the type of support that is perhaps uh, missing for the early stage uh, founders. So we are very much an intervention, intervention based model. We are very hands on with these uh, founders uh, and the founding team and, and, um, and the business itself. Um, that means we've got a team of designers, you know, data scientists, technologies, uh, technologists, um, you know, growth marketers, etc., working with these companies. Because if you're an early stage company, the chances are, I mean, you won't have access to a CTO or a CMO, uh, you know, or a product designer, a product developer, uh, let alone sort of a data scientist, etc. And if you have access to them, the chances are you can't afford them. So that, you know, that, that very, very quickly starts to affect, affect the business and its growth trajectory. Um, and the second thing, so tying the two together, you know, making sure that you uh, that, that, that um, the founders are developing the product and the technology based on a very clear market opportunity. So what you know, what is usually termed as the product to market fit, um, but tying that to very clear investment goals and milestones. So it's all very well to be building out a product uh, or platform or an app uh, or, or any piece of technology. Um, but you, unless you tie it to very clear sort of your next raise or your next bridge round, um, you, you know, you don't have that. Um, you won't be able to uh, sustainably get your business to that scale trajectory. And that's exactly what we focus on. Um, I think the, 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 the other thing that I sort of alluded to is um, you know, knowing the market, knowing the market context is incredibly, uh, incredibly important. And I can't emphasize this enough. Um, we're based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, we're operating across sub-Saharan Africa, being on the ground, um, knowing, you know, not only your businesses and the ventures, but also the users, um, knowing the landscape of, of, uh, of Nairobi, of, uh, of Addis, of Lagos, you know, of, uh, Cape Town, etc. Um, you need to be local, and you need to understand those nuances. You cannot do this, um, you know, from from a from an air conditioned office elsewhere. Um, so we are all building in market um, in Africa. So I think that's very important. Um, perhaps the last thing I would say is, as you've alluded to, Margaret, is um, what's really fascinating is. Uh, is to see our work um, with Standard Bank and our second investor, Netcare, as well. Yeah. Um, so we are a corporate-backed uh, 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 venture company. Um, what that means is uh, both Standard Bank Group and Netcare are our, net, our investors, our shareholders, um, and uh, we work with them uh, to catalyze both sort of on the startup uh, side and on the bank side, um, you know, clear opportunities, leveraging what Standard Bank brings to the table from an infrastructure, from technical expertise perspective, um, access to some of their customers through pilots, testing product, etc. Um, and pairing that obviously with, um, you know, again, the right needs of the of the business uh, at the right time of their of their growth. I think the 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 um, the nuance here is, and I sort of wanted to highlight that uh, um, is. Um, there's 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 kind of two different models of, of corporate innovation, if you like, uh, and uh, I see that as being very corporate focused, um, as in building things for the corporate um, and solving the corporate's uh, sort of challenges, let's say. And there's the kind of the external innovation uh, or corporate enabled innovation, which is you're uh, leveraging the corporate's infrastructure, IP assets, you know, uh, uh, technical uh, experts. But you're not necessarily building for the corporate. You're not building solutions for the corporate uh, pain points. You're building for the market, and you're building for the for the consumers on the ground. So we're the latter. Um, so whilst, and, and this is kudos to Standard Bank for understanding that actually scale comes from building for for market opportunities. It is not looking internally, um, and it is looking at how we can leverage uh, what we have working with some of the smartest people within fintech some of these early stage entrepreneurs uh, to actually develop solutions that are addressing uh, very clear user problems across africa 
Um, and that's no, absolutely. I think it was important that you made that uh, differentiation between internal and externally funded innovation and understanding how you generate scale around that. Um, I just wanted to comment when we we're talking about unicorns, I think it's appropriate and necessary to talk about zebras as another measure of success in the, on the continent, right? Not everyone who's starting out to solve a real market problem in Africa is trying to be a unicorn. Some think that it's appropriate, particularly since they may have to build the full tech stack and create other enabling um, solutions in the market to succeed, that you know, there's different categories of success. And I think the zebra terminology is, is super relevant. If time permits, Aline, I'd like to come back later to talk about the UN SDGs as uh, how private sector government investors and entrepreneurs collaborate. But I want to give Rachel ample opportunity to tell the MF MFS story because you as an organization in your six plus years at, um, at the helm helping to grow MFS have had the opportunity to participate in, in each of those sectors. And I thought it was interesting. Rachel and I, we've been in many conferences in Joburg and other places, but have never had the chance to talk. So nice to finally meet you. <laughs> but I saw yeah, you first your career at a Millennium Corporation in Washington. So there will be some people <laughs> whom you may know from Washington tuning in now or to the recording. All right. Yeah. Can you hear okay. me okay? Yep. Yeah. No, that's great. Great. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's great to finally cross paths in this way. Um, MFS Africa is, um, it's, it's really cool to be a part of this conversation because um, we have the fortune and privilege of being able to sit in the, on, on kind of both sides of, of many of these questions. So we are a startup uh, now um, in, our, in our 10th year of operation. And for those who don't know MFS Africa, we are Africa's largest digital payments platform. We're a B2B interoperability platform. If you are in Kenya and you open the M-Pesa menu to send to MTN or Airtel Uganda, we are powering that transaction. That's, that's our core business. Um, we partner with um, diaspora-based MTOs to connect to our uh, network of M&O um, networks connected to banks. So um, we have gone through the um, you know, the, the search for uh, seed capital and we've entertained multiple you know, uh, institutional investment and strategic investment discussions, the likes of which have been described here. Um, and um, we, we're very keenly aware of the opportunities uh, and challenges that those kinds of investment perspectives bring. Um, we've also made our own investments in the last couple of years, which I want to spend mo most of my time focusing on. Um, so I, um, in terms of partnerships though, and, and it, as a way of ex expanding on a, our uh, business model a little bit, I wanna respond to Miguel's uh, anecdote about, uh, we don't wanna partner with banks, we wanna disrupt the banks. Um, and I think that it's certainly as a company that's very entrenched in the mobile money world, we are used to that kind of conventional wisdom of that the fintechs, the mobile money is going to come eat the bank's lunch. The fintechs are here to the, disrupt the banks. Um, I, and I think that that narrative is, has really changed in the last like three or four years. Um, I think banks are increasingly aware that there's, there's, there's room for everyone and that it's not really about competing, um, other partnering. So as an example, we have a pan-African partnership with Echo Bank Group. So in, um, 20 something of, of their uh, countries, we power bank to wallet, wallet to bank and, and airtime purchase through their um, rapid transfer app. And that was an instance of a bank taking a digital first perspective of, you know, we're not trying to make every single mobile money user in this market a banked customer. We see that our banked customers have a need to interact with unbanked or mobile money using customers. Um, and we see it as a long tail opportunity to towards customer acquisition. Um, so we've been at the heart of some of those partnerships. Um, earlier this year, we purchased a company. Uh, we acquired uh, Bionic, which is a fantastic SME payments platform. And what was really cool about that deal, and you can listen to more details on this deal at a, on an episode of the Flip podcast that we did uh, earlier this year, um, we solved the interoperability problem from a kind of uh, outside in and cross-border 
perspective. They solve the interoperability problem from a primarily domestic and small business perspective. And um, the advantage of this deal was that both sides were very, very close to the tech and to the market. Um, so not only were we really aligned in vision, um, but we also had a very, very clear and concrete view of the implementation uh, of the synergies and how we, how we would get there. The vision and value alignment was great in terms of how we, how we act together if we disagree or if something goes badly. Um, but when Miguel expressed the kind of exit and IPO challenge that a lot of African uh, fintechs face, um, I think that one important lesson that our um, experience can, can bring to this discussion is that exit, exits can also mean that the journey continues with another, another fintech that's in an adjacent part of the market. Um, another benefit of or advantage of, of our um, investment acquisition process was that it was a much different type of decision process. So um, I think it was Miguel or Jorge who mentioned the um, decisions, you know, the, the impetus to make decisions in New York for an African market. Um, and even if those decisions are still being made on the continent, sometimes when those decisions come from a large institution, you know, the number of people that need to be convinced and to buy in is just, you know, can be literally orders of magnitude more than when it's a, it's a fellow player in the industry uh, making the investment. Um, so, so our experience really, uh, for, for us, um, I think validate some of the earlier comments about the ability to innovate um, and wanting to, to make sure that, that, um, that the innovation doesn't stop after the acquisition. Um, one of the kind of cautionary tales in our industry is of Fundamo, which was an amazingly innovative uh, mobile money platform that was purchased by Visa and then put on the shelf. Nothing has been done with it. Um, and so all of that energy, unfortunately, um, didn't get to uh, reach the market um, after a certain point. The, the product continued to be used to a point, but it wasn't maintained. And now other players are in the space that, that Fundamo was. Um, and it didn't get Visa what it wanted, what Visa wanted out of this. Um, and I think that that is in part due to just whether you're, you're set up for, for innovation. Um, the last point I want to make um, is about further investment in the ecosystem, not full acquisitions, but we at MFS Africa have what's called MFS Africa Frontiers, which is a bit of a, not quite a venture fund, but business development with capital. So we've made some minority investments in companies that are in adjacent relevant spaces um, where we can be not just a strategic partner in terms of expanding their payments platform, but we can actually help guide them in their, in their startup and innovation journey. So um, two investments we've made public are Accorian, which is an ag tech company based in Uganda, and Inclu Inclusivity Solutions, uh, headquartered in Cape Town, active across the continent, uh, doing um, inclusive in insurance products. So happy to take questions on, on any of the above. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, what is your uh, selection criteria for investing and mentoring these companies? I think selection criteria suggests a, a larger operation than we are. Um, but I our priority sectors are agriculture, insurance, um, healthcare, um, and identity. These are areas where we either you know, see an obvious opportunity, we know that we won't be able to build that ourselves, there's no value in us building it ourselves, but we know that many people are building those solutions and they're having to spend their time um, you know, in, uh, in endless meetings to get a single m and integration and then to go to the next m and integration, um, et cetera. And so we can be a uh, a kind of springboard to scale by offering our API, which connects to our entire network of 36 African countries. And we can also provide some advice and um, in addition to, to the capital and the, and the commercial arrangement to, to be their payments partner. Um, so it would normally be, you know, certainly companies working in Africa, companies working at a, uh, a scale that, you know, who have the, who have a visible path to scale um, and who are working on the on parts of the ecosystem where we can see payments being an accelerant. Thank you. And, and Rachel, could you talk, I mean, since your MFS works across 36 markets, 
about the regulatory landscape in Africa and, and how you ensure scale when you have different regimes and regulations in each of these disparate markets. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I should clarify that our, our company name is MFS Africa, not to be so that we're not confused with Doctors Without Borders. Um, we are when we power services in 36 markets. And what that means is that we are partnered with um, regulated, licensed uh, companies, such primarily mobile uh, network operators. So if we take um, move in Togo. So move is the mobile network. They have a mobile money, um, service. They are regulated by the BCAO, not only to do mobile money in the first place. So to be a deposit taking entity, um, and to run an agent network. So they'll have that license before we even start talking, but they also have an approval from, um, the, the BCAO again, in this case to do cross border payments, um, over mobile. Um, in this particular in example, um, the base out limits mobile networks to in zone, um, transactions, unless there is a partner bank in the mix. Um, but in the, by the same token, when we partner with, um, Safaricom, they are regulated by the bank of Kenya. Um, and when we connect transactions coming in from world remit, who's licensed in Europe and the UK, um, it's, it's under those licenses that the transaction is, is, is regulated. We are licensed as a financial services intermediary, but we are not the, we're not holding the customer funds. Um, so the regular, we do face regulatory challenges, um, but mostly towards opening additional corridors. So we would love for every one of our um, hundred plus partners to connect to each other um, Unfortunately, not only is there a regulatory obstacle to connecting, uh, you know, Malawi to Senegal, there also isn't a huge market for that corridor. Um, but as we expand into more um, commercial um, merchant services, we will see that those transactions will not just be based on on migration patterns. That that will will see an increasing demand to connect everyone to everyone, which is really our vision. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm going to just take a moment and launch a poll that we put together to invite the audience to give us some feedback if they would. Um, that's one of the downsides to obviously having a virtual event is we don't get to see the audience. I <laughs> really want to know them. <laughs> um, great. So that's uh, launch. Audience, please feel free to type your poll response. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and if I could direct the regulatory question, Jorge, to you also, since you've had the opportunity to work in across emerging markets globally um, in thinking about the, the connecting financial institutions and fintechs in Africa, do you feel like regulatory barriers are a bigger deal than they might be in LATAM or, or um, Asia? I think they're less of a problem as uh, everyone would like to think. And when I say people would like to think is sometimes bankers, and, and I am a banker too, right? I'm, I, I come from a story of, so it, I'm not talking bad about bankers. I love bankers, I'm a banker, yeah. but it's just that we are, we always have worked around uh, heavy regulation. And sometimes we tend to say that regulation do doesn't allow to for us to grow. And I think that's not necessarily true. I think it's uh, it's a matter of how you innovate, how you truly partner. Because uh, when we're talking about partnering and, and, and what Rachel was talking about, it's uh, you need to leverage different partners' abilities and, um, and assets. So when a financial institution partners with a fintech and the fintech is providing B2B services, the regulatory scheme is not as complex because the the financial institution is the one that has the license. They're regulated. They know how to do this. One of the biggest assets that financial institutions have is this knowledge of compliance. They compliance. That that's what they actually do, right? They are good at talking to the regulator and all of that. FinTechs are good at innovating and creating new technology. So that's the partnerships that you have to look for. You know. When, when fintechs start trying to solve the regulatory issue and they're trying to 
come up with ways that they have to have the license everywhere where they want to operate, then there's they start to get into this discussion that they shouldn't be in. You know, I, I when I was talking about evaluation, one of the topics that to me are extremely important when you think about evaluation is your ability to scale. So partnerships should give you the ability to scale. And when we're talking about regulatory issues, you have to be innovative to solve for, for compliance and regulatory issues. I'm not saying that you have to go around regulation by no means. It's just that different partners bring different expertise and they bring assets to the table. So, so the, the way to solve for regulation is not to talk with regulators, is not to try to change the regulation because that, that means years, right? And mm -hmm. that means uh, 50 regulatory agencies throughout the region, I'm talking Africa. So are you gonna, how are you going to solve for that? Maybe by 2040, when you meet again in 2040, or you meet with my <laughs> then, well, we're not going to be there yet, right? So we need to solve for regulatory issues in the next 12 months. The way to solve for that is partnership. It's not going and trying to change the regulatory environment. Forget about that. There's too much money to be spent on that, too much time. It's too narrowly focused on one specific geography. Because if you want to solve regulation in Kenya, you have to go and talk to the regulator in Kenya. Then you go to Ghana, then you go to Ethiopia, then you, you it's a never ending story. So my advice to those of you that want to really gain um, a scale it, and you want to solve for regulation, think different, innovate, partner, and try to find ways to how can you gain scale without having to go and change something that you don't have the power to do so. Thank you. That was really practical advice. And just um, observing the, the participant list for the event, it was really heartening to see quite a few African regulators signed up to participate in, in the summit and uh, the Mauritius government sandbox represented too. So I think Although you're absolutely right that changing regulation is a very long-term and expensive time-consuming process, there's a growing will willingness in some African jurisdictions to collaborate with the private sector as long as we're working to a goal that is actually, again, providing more affordable, secure uh, services to the majority of the population. Um, we are almost out of time. I think we said we had 50 minutes, so we're over time. Uh, Alina, is there any closing statement you wanted to share with the, with the group? Um, I think it's been a really healthy uh, and very interesting discussion. Uh, I was making notes as everybody was speaking. I uh, couldn't agree with you more, Margaret, about the sandbox piece. And I think Ethiopia and South Africa has, has made strides in, in, in that uh, way. I think the, 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 the sort of the word or the message that stood out for me when thinking about this topic and build, you know, building things, partnering, buying, M&A, growing, scaling um, corporates, fintechs um, is, is risk. And I think more than anything, I think it is having appetite to take risk um, and making incremental changes uh, or iterations and pivots, adapting. Uh, here we are talking via, via a platform right. when in reality we would have been uh, together in a, in a pandemic. Um, so I think taking risks and it's both you know, for corporates and large institutions, but it's also for startups because I think, you know, a, a lot of the time, the um, when opportunity arises, we as, as human beings want to get to the answer before figuring out and testing some of those solutions. So taking risk for me um, is is, uh, is is what will lead to scale and, and to better and more quality partnerships um, and strategic alliances. Well, thank you. And we have a really exciting day ahead of us um, with a number of panels and Jack Dorsey gracing uh, a keynote address later today. So let's uh, tune in to, to the next session. And thank you, uh, panelists, for your time and attention. And audience, we're disappointed not to have questions from you, but uh, hopefully we can uh, be reached on LinkedIn. And I just wanted to encourage the other speakers. You mentioned some research reports and podcasts. 
And if, if you would do us a favor and just uh, reference those on your LinkedIn profile so the audience can access that information, I think that'd be really valuable. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Bye. Um.